Hello everyone, I'm Darius and I'm uh, going to talk today about booting a Linux kernel under Beehive on ARM v7. Uh, the ARM v7 platform was chosen as uh, the starting point for the ARM virtualization since at the time this uh, project was started in, way back in 2015, uh, the ARM v8 processors were not readily available on the market. Uh, the implementation started was started by Mihai Karabash together with uh, Pe uh, Peter Grehan uh, at the um, Google Summer of Code project and then la was later continued by uh, some other students including me. I have a um, working experience with Beehive for roughly two and a half years. I've started by working on ARM v7 and then later moved on to uh, the snapshot uh, save and restore feature for um, AMD 64 Beehive. Uh, the implementation for ARM v7 for Beehive uh, has a quite limited feature set. That means it's only able to virtualize the CPU, memory, and RAM disk. It doesn't really support uh, any advanced features such as uh, disk or Ethernet. But um, was used as a proof of concept for later implementations. We do have um, an Army V8 implementation that um, has been started and is being worked on, but um, it's not uh, in the scope of this uh, presentation. The Army V7 implementation was based on the ARM, the MDA64 implementation, sorry, um, and uh, was forked uh, back in uh, 2015 to, and re-implement some of the features. That is, it uh, implements uh, the core Beehive Run functionality together with uh, memory mappings and um, transfer the, the transfer of control between the hypervisor and the host or kernel uh, or guest kernels, sorry. <coughs> it uh, also supports Vertio through the MMIO interface. I've been working on this uh, roughly two years ago. Uh, it has a working block console network and uh, random interface support. It's been forked from the Vertio over PCI implementation that was used in on AMD 64 and uh, implemented the in implement sorry the 0.9.4 version of the standard for Vertio devices. That is um, that means that it is a legacy uh, functionality at this point because. Um, the standard has evolved uh, past the 1.0 version and uh, this uh, becomes one of the issues that we've discovered by running Linux on uh, the Beehive on the ARM v7 hypervisor. As you know, building FreeBSD has a separate build system from the uh, Linux build system. It uh, works by combining both the world and the kernel images in the same uh, build system and is able to kind of mix both of them in order to create uh, a more complete kernel image. Uh, that is, you can get um, the kernel to include a device tree specification file in it by default and uh, you can also use mtree uh, to create a RAM disk that is included in the kernel uh, by default. That means you can have a single uh, image that has both the um, device tree and the RAM disk included as a single binary blob. You don't have to do anything specific to get it working. 
the RAM disk uh, is based on the Rescue and uh, we use it for most basic functions such as cat, ch mode, ch root, ch own, date, echo and ls and so on. It is this makes it very easy to create a RAM disk and then uh, putting it in the kernel and to use it as uh, the primary boot image. On Linux, the make process is uh, quite different. The Linux kernel only includes the kernel itself. It does not include any additional functionality. It doesn't have a rescue binary or anything similar attached to it. Uh, and you have to use um, some other tools to do it. It generates a single kernel file. Uh, well, that is. It generates just the kernel file in uh, the various formats, that is a raw image or a compressed image and does not contain the device tree blob by default. The device tree blob is the um, binary format for the device tree specification file, but it can be used uh, using the DD um, fun binary uh, and you have to build it separately using uh, DTC, the device tree compiler from the device tree source or DTS file. Remember this file you could include by default on the FreeBSD side uh, of the kernel compilation and you didn't have to do anything more. So, to build a Linux image with a device tree blob, I had to create a large file, say 20 megabytes, uh, using the truncate um, utility, and dump the raw kernel image at the beginning of the file, the, that is the image file, the file called image, that is uncompressed, at the beginning of the large file and then dump the device tree blob file at offset say 16 megabytes in order to not overwrite any part of the kernel that that's sitting at the beginning of a file. Uh, this is uh, because we do not have the possibility to offer a separate file for the device tree blob and we have to make a single file a single file that contains both both the kernel and the device tree blob the ram disk cannot be automatically included either the linux kernel building as i've said only builds the kernel so you have to use a third root a third party tool like uh, build root and uh, busybox in order to create the RAM disk and include it in the kernel file. Uh, the result is quite similar to the kernel that is built by FreeBSD, but they are um, quite a, using a quite a different approach. Busybox is a, a static file that has quite sim a fi similar functionality to the rescue. Uh, that means it can be used for cat, echo, date, grep, and so on, in order to get a basic, the basic functionality for um, your system. Our testing environment used the um, fast model simulator from the, provided by ARM themselves uh, for the A15 uh, series processor. And that was our FreeBSD host. And uh, we ran a bare bones Linux guest, uh, similar to a bare bones uh, FreeBSD guest that we built uh, using M3. We built this one using Buildroot. And uh, its functionality, it's hopefully similar to the FreeBSD guest. However, the, in practice, we've discovered that there were quite a few differences that um, we had to take into account when running the Linux um, 
guessed. For one, the Linux address space is not uh, structured identically to the FreeBSD one. The, at first, we had uh, been using memory pass-through to pass the three gigabytes memory, uh, one gigabyte of memory starting at three gigabytes, that is starting at uh, 0xc00000, um, to the guest virtual machine and uh, had it use that as its uh, physical memory. By pass-through, I mean we mapped the host's uh, address space from 3 to 4 gigabytes to the guest's um, address space of uh, 3 to 4 gigabytes. But Linux was not happy with using that address space. It's likely because it tried to use the address space, at least part of the address space from 3 to 4 gigabytes for system reserved functionality. Uh, we're not quite sure, but uh, after moving it, the starting address to 0x80000, that is the 2 gigabyte uh, boundary, the guest didn't um, throw an error that it couldn't allocate any memory or use the memory. Also, uh, you had to specify the DTB address. The device tree blob should have an address. Both Linux and FreeBSD ABIs specified that uh, the R2 register should be set in order to specify the memory location of the DTB in the boot image or the guest memory in our case. FreeBSD can run without setting the R2 register, likely because uh, the image is built by the makefile itself it, and doesn't really rely on uh, any external tools to specify where it is. The make system knows where it puts the kernel image and the kernel at least knows uh, where to look for it. Linux, however, cannot do that because the Linux kernel is built separately from the DTB. Uh, we put it at, in a binary blob um, separately and it doesn't know where to look for it. So we had to change the Beehive Run main, or at least I did, in order to specify where the device tree blob is located in memory. This is not very likely a future-proof implementation, but it worked uh, for our purposes. One interesting issue is that um, I uh, specified a bad timer in the device tree source. Um, I think I forgot to mention the interrupt controller for the timer. So, oh, or I didn't, no, sorry, uh, it was a bad device pass-through for the timer and the guest could not access the timer properly. The result was that the Linux kernel kind of froze. Uh, it has, in the very early parts of the boot process, a code sequence similar to this one. Tix equals gfis, and while tix equals gfis, that is, the GFIS variable is not updated, uh, it did nothing. So the kernel, because the guest uh, timer was not accessible, it could not update GFIS, and as a consequence, the Linux kernel kind of froze. It was a strange thing to debug because there was really no output uh, that could be used at this point the kernel kind of stood there. So um, I had to go through the kernel and add some messages or kind of see where it uh, got stuck. And uh, it was around this um, while loop. In order to get the kernel output, the FreeBSD uses the BVM console uh, for debugging purposes. Now we have this implemented on ARMv7 
but um, the Linux kernel does not have a similar console implemented by default. The BVM console is implemented as a special driver in the Lin in the FreeBSD guest, sorry. And uh, it reads writes at address uh, 0x1c09000. That is a UART port, but um, the interactive console functionality is specific to FreeBSD. Linux can use it. Uh, you can use early print K. Uh, you can configure it to use that same address, but for um, output purposes only. You cannot use that specific address in order to get input on the console. This provide uh, this um, has been a bit of an issue because we did not have any interactive input to the kernel and all debugging efforts we took starting this point uh, we had to go and rebuild the images uh, even possibly either the kernel or the or the build root uh, in order to add something to the ram disk in order to change the functionality of the Linux kernel um, or as you say to get it to take some input. Um, so despite using the early print K and it being configured to use the same address as BVM console, there was no output that was displayed. Uh, while investigated this issue, uh, I found that at some point a uh, patch or in the kernel implemented some uh, wrapper functions that did not allow it to call the print ASCII uh, system call or function in assembler that um, kind of transferred the information back and forth between the guest and the host. Uh, I had to rewrite part of the early print K function in order to drop the wrapper functions and uh, make it directly call print ASCII. At this point, it started printed, uh, printing some information on the guest console and uh, we could see that the Linux kernel started doing something. However, the early print K is a kernel specific functionality. Print K means print kernel is a debugging feature on uh, Linux, but um, is not usually available once reaching the user space. The user space should have some more advanced functionality in order to interact with it, uh, maybe use some UART lines or other types of um, virtual consoles in order to get interactive input and output. The early print K is only, should only be used by default to get debugging information of the kernel. So once we reach the user space, the early print K stopped working. Um, while digging through the uh, kernel make files, I found that uh, there is a TTY print K uh, functionality that relies on early print K. That is, a special device is created in the slash dev hierarchy called slash dev slash TTY print K in order to allow the different shells or uh, uh, binaries in the um, user space to print information through the early print K mechanism. We tried using this in order to get some more information on the state of the boot process because we did not have an interactive console. 
in order to fix this issue, we thought of using Vertio. Vertio was implement, implemented before trying to start a Linux kernel. The Vertio devices um, are a set of per virtualization mechanisms used to allow the guest to know that it's a, vir a virtual guest, but provide some uh, functionality such as console or uh, block uh, storage to guests without modifying them. The Linux guests support the um, virtual device implementation and they uh, are implemented to work with uh, versions 1.0 and uh, forward. Um, we had to use the, we tried to use them because the RAM disk cannot be used for permanent storage. The RAM disk should only be used to boot the guest, get the initial part of the uh, initialization process done and then uh, change the storage to a more permanent one. We use the Vertio block storage for storage I had uh, a block device through Vertio passed to the guest and um, also we tried to use the Vertio console for interaction with the guest that is we uh, meaning uh, to get a Vertio a interactive console to get input and output from the guest booting Linux using Vertio proved a bit problematic because the Beehive Vertio devices followed spe the specification 0.9.4 as I've said um, in the beginning but uh, Linux de devices complained that the legacy bit is not set the legacy implementation has a specific bit set in the device uh, virtualization that uh, mentions that it is um, implementing a version of the specification prior to 0.1, uh, 1.2, sorry. The FreeBSD drivers did not check that uh, this bit is set. So this issue passed while testing using a FreeBSD guest. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the driver implementa implemented version um, is it may have been also 0.9.4 or prior so at this point the legacy implementation uh, the legacy bit may have uh, not been required but uh, Linux complained that uh, you know trying to use a version prior to 1.0 must set the legacy bit uh, booting into Linux user space uh, proved uh, to be problematic because the ttyprintk functionality uh, printed an error that it could not find the slash dev slash console um, device. That is because the entries in slash dev are not created by devfsd automatically in the bare bones functionality provided by uh, buildroot so we had to create a custom init uh, script in, that creates the slash dev slash tty print k and slash dev slash console dev entries and uh, make the slash dev slash console point to the tty print k device in order to get the um, <coughs> script to print information to the um, uh, through the early print k function to the um, console that we had for the virtual machine <coughs> so we could inspect the um, system file hierarchy and uh, both the virtual block and 
console devices did exist, we could mount them and uh, mount the block device, sorry, and um, get information through the console, but we could not, I could not find the mechanism to set the virtual console to be the default console for the system, to be an interactive console. We, I only could uh, get it to pass messages. Some more work could have been, uh, maybe could have been useful in order to get uh, this part also done. But uh, at this point it was. Uh, the virtual block device simply contain was formatted using um, an ext4 format and passed through the passed through to the guest, and then uh, mounted. And we could find that uh, some files that I've put uh, on the partition were visible to the guest. As a result, we've demonstrated that uh, Linux can boot under Beehive on uh, ARMv7 and that uh, virtual devices on Linux are operable and, uh, under Beehive on ARMv7. Uh, but we could not, I could not get the console entirely functional and the guest be interactive. Other than that, I think uh, the Linux kernel and uh, guest in its entirety could be could have been um, passed as uh, functional. <laughs> um, for future work, we don't really intend to keep improving the ARMv7 implementation. It was uh, more of a proof of concept work. It uh, got us to a kind of good point, but um, the efforts are not really worth. So we've redirected them to the ARMv8 implementation because that is likely what we'll have to use or will be useful in the future once um, server chips based on the ARMv8 um, compute nodes will be available and uh, have good enough performance. So ARMv7 is uh, not entirely a, of interest from the virtualization perspective. Uh, we are working currently with uh, some students to bring up the ARMv8 implementation and uh, refactor the code. Um, it's been in uh, talks with the community to separate the code in machine dependent and machine independent functionality. And we've also talked to Andrew Turner who uh, said that they, uh, he's also been working on the ARMv8 uh, implementation for Beehive and um, he got it going and uh, tested it on um, his own uh, machine. Uh, that is greatly encouraging and uh, we plan to get things working with him, uh, with his help if he's willing to help us in the future or uh, otherwise get things done or on, on her own, I guess. Um, the code is currently available on GitHub. The branch is uh, Beehive ARM64, the branch we are currently working on um, for the refactoring purposes. And uh, thank you for uh, listening to this presentation and um, I'll gladly take your questions and answer them. Since this is a pre-recorded uh, presentation, I'm not entirely sure how the Q&A session will go, but I'll do my best to answer all your questions. Thank you.